Before I dive into the episode today, I thought you might just be interested in the sources I'm being used for this specific series of episodes on St. George. So if you're interested, I, I'm going to tell you my books right now, otherwise just skip ahead a couple minutes. Um, but the books I'm using are the Complete Letters by uh, Pliny the Younger by Oxford World Classics. It's well annotated, and I, I have a web doc, a web book, an ebook, so it's hyperlinked. Uh, it's pretty cool, so you can every little part of it is is kind of hyperlinked, so you can just click a look, look and, or pardon me, click a link, and it gives you some more specific inf information about things Pliny's referencing within Roman history. So uh, if you're going to get the complete letters by Pliny the Younger. I recommend the ebook version if you can get one that has these hyperlinks in it. So the Oxford World Classics version is the one I've got, and uh, I, I like it because of the hyperlinks, which gives some more context and details to the information that Pliny writes in. If you're interested in just the section about Christianity, which is what I'm going to be discussing in this episode, it's book 10 is the one you want. Uh, I have the complete letters because I was interested in the entirety of Roman life, and Pliny spends an awful lot talking about his daily life, so I got the whole thing so I could read all of uh, Pliny's thoughts about Roman life. Another book I have is called uh, Millennium by Tom Holland. It's a minor, minor source. It's actually uh, mostly about... The uh, thoughts, or pardon me, the events surrounding the year uh, 1000 Common Era, uh, but it does have some sections leading up to um, that time, and and the kind of opening sections of the book talk about the time period that I have. So I happen to have Millennium, and so uh, I pulled some sections of that for some of the content for this. Another book I have by Tom Holland that I'm using in this series is a book called Dominion, and it is about Christianity, Christian thought, and how Christianity evolved and developed. And because a significant chunk of this series involves early Christianity and Christians around AD, or pardon me, around 200, 300 Common Era. I thought that book would be interesting, and I was just interested in it myself. So that's a very well-written book, and I definitely recommend Dominion by Tom Holland. I'm also using The Passion of Saints Perpetua and Felicity, that is by uh, Perpetua. And the last book I'm using, and one that I am drawing majorly on, especially in my next episode, and that is the book... The Roman Empire from Severus to Constantine by Patricia Southern. It's extremely detailed and there's a lot of great information in there. Um, so if you're at all interested about the what's known as the crisis of the third century, it's a good book to pick up. So uh, that's the sources I'm using for this series. There was one other book I just didn't have the time uh, to get to, uh, but I will put it out there. And if you're interested in reading more about early Christians and what they thought about themselves, instead of um, reading other people writing about Christians, I always like to read the original sources if I can get get it and get translations. So one of those sources is from a early Christian church leader, a man by the name of Origen, who is a Roman citizen who lived in Alexandria. He lived during the third century, right in the middle of this time period. And there was a book a man called Celsus wrote that was talking down about Christianity, and Origen wrote a book called Against Celsus in response to Origen's claims about why Christians are bad and, and all that sort of stuff. 
So that's one I, I want to read. It's on my list. I just didn't have time to get to it for this podcast. But I'm mentioning it because I think it's probably worth a read, especially if you're interested in firsthand accounts about early Christianity. So that's Origin about, or pardon me, Origin Against Celsus. But those are the sources that I'm using for this series, and plus one more that I wanted to get to that I just didn't have time. Okay, let's get to the podcast now. Hello everybody, my name is Jeremy Agnew, host of the Grimdark History Podcast, where we explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. If this is your first time tuning in, what we do on this podcast is do deep dive into the nitty gritty, get into all the interesting details about what was life really like in the places and times and uh, looking at the people that popular fiction sometimes sets itself in historically. So you may have been watching a movie, watching a television show, maybe playing a video game or reading a book, something that set itself in our own history. And you may have asked yourself the question, was it really like that? You know, did they really do this? Did this person say this thing? You know, what what was real versus the uh, author or director or the writer or whoever it was taking artistic license to tell you an entertaining story? So this podcast seeks to get into those nitty gritty details of the fascinating parts of history that our popular fiction sets itself in. For season one, we've been exploring one particular character in popular fiction. It is an immortal human. He was, he's known as the Emperor of Mankind, and he exists in the popular fictional universe of Warhammer 40,000. So we've been exploring all through season one, all the different times and places and historical people this immortal character has been. And we're arriving at today, starting our last episode of season one. We're exploring the last historical figure we know this immortal human was. And that historical figure is St. George. I spent a lot of my time thinking about what what do we know about St. George, you know, pop culture-wise, versus what was just in this few paragraphs of text that we have about the the character. So I thought in my head, you know, when I think of St. George, what do I think of? You know, do searches online. You know, what what do you see about St. George? And maybe even some of the other popular fictions St. George has popped up in that, that I'm consciously aware of. So some of those things I, I think about is, A, I, I often think of St. George as a knight slaying a dragon. I, that's, you know, it's a very popular image of St. George. It's probably one of the most popular stories that people know of, at least on the surface. They're aware of this. St. George slayed a dragon. And so uh, I thought... What would be interesting is as I started doing my research into the historical figure and time of place of St. George is I came to know a few things about St. George right away that gave me a direction to go with this podcast to make it interesting and get into those interesting nitty gritty details that I was talking about. You know, what's the podcast about? And so I thought I'd start with just talking about St. George at at a very high level and understand the time and place of St. George, and let's build up from there. At the surface level, you know, if you do any research online about St. George, you're probably going to go to his Wikipedia page right away. 
You might find a few other things, but Wikipedia is going to be right up there in your top two, three initial sources you look at to get a, a surface look at St. George. Doing that, you will find out that St. George was born sometime in the 3rd century, that he died roughly around the turn of the 3rd century into the 4th century. It's, he died in what's commonly known as the Christian purges of Diocletian. And so that's an important element to St. George. He is a Christian in the 3rd century. And so while I was thinking about that, I was wondering, okay, he's a, he's a Christian in the 3rd century and looking on his Wikipedia page, you find out he was born in, in Anatolia and a region called Cappadocia in the Roman Empire. And he spent most, if not all, his life in and around that region and into the Mediterranean area of the Levant and Egypt. So very much a Eastern Roman person. So we know he's a Christian. We know he lived during the third century. We know he was born within the Roman Empire and lived within the Roman Empire. And we know he spent his time in some of these regions. So I thought my approach would be, let's try and figure out what was happening in the Roman Empire in these places at this time what was life like as a roman citizen we know he was a roman soldier so what was what was what were the roman armies doing at this time and we know he's a christian so well what's christianity like at this time why why, why is there a christian purge by diocletian those are some of the questions that were popping in my head and i thought it would this is what I would make the podcast about, is let's explore early Christianity up to this time. Let's explore Rome and the history of Rome in this third century. And let's explore what the Roman armies are doing and what a Roman so soldier is doing. And let's explore what led to the Christian purges that happened right at the turn to the 4th century, where St. George was supposedly uh, caught up in the persecutions by Diocletian. So this is where we're going to take the podcast as we go through the series. As I started doing my research, I came into a lot of fascinating and crazy stuff that was happening in the Roman Empire in this time. So uh, that is going to be an episode, maybe even two in its own right. Thought what I would do in this episode is explore early Christianity and some of the information we have that are uh, third-hand accounts, second-hand accounts, maybe even first-person accounts of early Christians up to the, the third century. So that's what this episode is going to be about because I found a lot of fascinating things as I was doing this research and I want to share those with you so we can have a context of what were early Christians like, what were they thinking, what were they doing, and also have an understanding of what were Romans thinking and doing at this time that might make them have conflict or not conflict against Christians as they were coming across them. So this is going to be episode one. I've got a, a, a lot of interesting details as we're going to go through this, so I think we're going to dive right in here. To start things off, I looked for what was the first or earliest account of Christians from outside the Bible. You know, if you're interested in the, you know, the life of the apostles and Jesus, you know, the very first Christians, there is the New Testament, which of course is probably the authoritative source on the lives of those people. 
So go ahead and read that if you like. Uh, but that's a, a book that millions of people are already very familiar with. What you're probably not familiar with and what was interesting to me that made me want to dig up is what were other people thinking about these early Christians, these first couple generations. And so I was doing research just trying to track down what is the earliest non-Christian account of other Christians. And I came across a Roman who's known by the name of Pliny the Younger. Pliny was born right at the tail end of the Julio-Claudian line. He was born like within a year or two of Nero's death. After Nero died, if you were with me in the last episode when we talked about the first Jewish-Roman war, Nero is, uh, he dies, he commits suicide during a palace coup, and there's chaos and civil war, uh, an initial period uh, after his death within the Roman Empire. The time period is known as the year of the four emperors, and it's because of that shock, you know, surprise, surprise, there were four people who all claimed the title of emperor within this time period, and they all got off one way or the other. Following the year of the four emperors is the three emperors known as Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. Vespasian takes over during the First Jewish-Roman War. This is when he becomes the emperor following the Year of the Four Emperors. He fights a brief civil war, establishes his own dynasty and called the Flavian Dynasty. And his two children, Titus and Domitian, they become the successive emperors of this line. And then... Vespasian supposedly, well, depends on what account you read. In one account, Vespasian offs Titus. In another account, Titus just dies of an illness or was poisoned, like food poisoning or something like that. In another account, Vespasian's responsible for that. Doesn't matter. Uh, What matters is Vespasian is the emperor and he rules for a significant chunk of time. And he ticks off, as Roman emperors do, some or more parts of the Roman elite. And Vespasian himself is offed. Following Vespasian is what's known as the Nerva Antonine Antoni, pardon me, the Nerva Antonine Dynasty. Pardon me there. This starts right at the turn of the first century so like 80 or pardon me 96 common era and uh, so emperor nerva is the first one nerva appoints trajan as emperor and trajan is emperor from 98 common era to 117 this is the time period where we get in our own records the first non-christian account of other Christians. This is the world of Pliny the Younger. He's grown up through the Flavian dynasty, so through the Domitian, Vespasian, Titus era. He was a senator during the reign of Domitian. He hated Domitian personally. He was happy with uh, Nerva and Trajan, he supported them, and it tremendously helped his career as a senator. And under the rule of Trajan, Pliny the Younger is appointed governor of a place called Pontus Bithynia. Pontus Bithynia is the uh, northern area of modern-day Turkey, roughly from uh, modern-day Istanbul, all the way over to Trebizond, I think is the the modern day name of it. So a good chunk of the northern coastline of uh, along the Black Sea of Turkey, that was the province that Pliny the Younger was appointed governor of when he writes 
to the Emperor Trajan about a giant pile of Christians that he's uncovered in his province. Now, Pliny himself, he's what I would describe or what modern day people, if you were um, looking for some information, you know, how do I describe this guy? You'd call him, uh, you know, he's a giant nerd or he's a giant geek. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. I myself am a huge geek. Um, so uh, Pliny the Younger is one of these people. He's also extremely reserved and I would say uptight about a lot of things. He's not the kind of guy you want hanging out with. You, you want to hang out with at a party, uh, but he's the kind of guy that you want to sit down with and maybe have a glass of wine and talk some philosophy with. He was fascinated by the natural world and natural phenomenon. He wrote letters to colleagues describing um, a lake or a little pool that's on one of his properties. And he spends the entire letter just describing and wondering about the natural forces that cause this pool of water to periodically and rhythmically drain and fill as though they were controlled by the tides you know it's it's that rhythmic you can almost set a clock to it you can sit down by it next to the pool you watch it slowly drain out and then later on you watch it slowly fill again the stream's nowhere near connected to the mediterranean ocean or the black sea or anything so he's you know he wonders what what does this you know what what natural force does this and he compares it or imagines that way up in the mountains somewhere wherever the source of the stream is there's something pushing it back and forth the flow of water and that there's a cavity of air in there much like a jug uh, filled with water you know you get a jug filled with water and you tip it over and you try to pour it out and it doesn't really pour out because the air is kind of blocking proper flow and that at a certain point you know, air escapes or the water gets in front of the air and then whoosh, all the water comes out and then some force kind of push, you know, as the water drains out, the air fills back in, interrupts the flow of water. And so Pliny imagines this is happening. So you can, you can get from just this one letter his fascination with the natural world. Pliny is a senator. He's fabulously wealthy he owns lots of property he has lots of slaves he believes in a moderate li life though he helps fund the education of uh, non or pardon me education of the poor in his hometown so he believes in education he believes you know he's fascinated by natural phenomenon he wonders about spirituality so he's on the fence about uh, whether ghosts exist, spirits, that type of thing. But he is also a prolific and well-known and well-respected lawyer within the criminal justice system of the Roman Empire. He presides as a judge in what's known as the Centimvir Courts. I may be pronouncing that wrong. My Latin's not very strong. But the Centimvir Courts is a place for, it's basically the supreme court of the Roman Empire. It's the place where, uh, you know, high crimes and, and giant misdemeanors are brought out as he also oversees as a lawyer wills and helps mediate legal disputes. So he's an extremely active person within the Senate and within this court system, and he presides either as a lawyer or as a judge over significant cases, you know, high crime cases. So he's a very methodical, very um, mental type of person, and he's appointed by the Emperor Trajan as the governor of this province, Bithynia, or pardon me, Pontus Bithynia. And while he's there, during his first year on the job, he uncovers this sect of Christians. And he writes to the emperor. And, and where am I getting all this information from? Well, when you know, I say 
Pliny was a uh, prolific and huge nerd, well, he wrote down every letter that he capped, all his speeches that he spoke in the Senate and at the courts, and he published them all. You can buy and read the what's known as the Complete Letters of Pliny. So that's what I read um, in order to get this account. I have the Complete Letters of Pliny. You don't need the Complete Letters of Pliny if you want to get just the section about the Christians. It was in one letter from Book 10 of Pliny's uh, letters. So I'm going to read um, the initial letter to the emperor to you, or, or sections of it anyway. So this letter was written somewhere between 110 and 111 Common Era, and it's a letter Pliny the Younger is writing to the emperor Trajan as during his first year as governor of this province in uh, northern Anatolia. So I'm going to, quoting Pliny now, I have never attended hearings concerning Christians, so I am unaware of what is usually punished or investigated and to what extent. I am more than a little in doubt where there is to be distinction between ages and to what extent the young should be treated no differently from the more hardened whether pardon should be granted to repentance, whether the person has been a Christian in some sense should not benefit by having renounced it, whether it is time, or pardon me, whether it is the name Christian itself, untainted with crimes, or the crimes which cling to the name, that which should be punished. So I'll end quote, and let's just talk a little bit about that opening sentence there. What Pliny is saying is, well, he, you know, he, he's a lawyer. He's been and attended a lot of cases, but he's never seen one concerning Christians. So he's unfamiliar with the law. And he makes two distinctions there in his initial opening to the Emperor Trajan. He's not sure whether just being Christian itself, the name Christian is a crime, or whether it is something Christians do which makes it a crime. So maybe it's okay to be Christian as long as you're not doing this one thing, or maybe just the fact of being Christian is itself a crime, and he's unsure of this. So this tells you a little bit about Romans thinking at this time, and again, we're at 110, 111 Common Era. Pliny is one of the most knowledgeable lawyers within the Roman Empire, or at least that's what he tells us he is. So if he's not confident about what the law is concerning Christians, you can bet that the rest of the Roman Empire itself is unsure of, what do I do when I find a Christian? Pliny continues in his letter, quoting Pliny now, I asked them whether they were Christians. If they admitted it, I asked them a second and a third time, threatening them with execution. Those that remained obdurate I ordered to be executed, for I was in no doubt whatever it was which they were confessing that their obstinacy and their inflexible stubbornness should at any rate be punished. Others, similarly lunatics, were Roman citizens, so I registered them as due to be sent back to Rome. So this is Pliny writing, continuing in his letter to the Emperor Trajan about what he's done so far in terms of how he's dealt with this initial group of Christians. He asked them, A, are, are you a Christian? And do you want to recant? So if they admit that they were Christians, he asked them a second time and a third time, and he threatens them with execution if they will not recant. And those who remained obdurate, those who refused to recant their Christian them, he ordered them to be executed. Now you might think right then and there, well, that's Christian persecution. And in one way, it definitely is uh, un undoubtedly Christian persecution, but it is not Christian persecution in that Plenty or Pliny or any Roman is out hunting Christians. 
and we'll find that out a little later on, but just to give you an idea, because he says whatever it was which they were confessing, it was their obstinacy and their inflexible stubbornness that should at any rate be punished. Because remember in the starting paragraph, Pliny saying, I don't know, it, does it, is simply being Christian, par, pardon me, is simply being Christian a crime in and of itself, or is it something Christians do, which is criminal, that is what is punished. Pliny says he punishes them because of their inflexible stubbornness and their obstinacy. Willful disobedience to any judicial command. And remember, Pliny is the governor, so he has an absolute judicial authority within this province. So if he commands them to recant their Christianity and they don't, that act in itself is a crime. Now, it didn't necessarily need to be Christianity. Pliny could have gone up and ordered any one person, you know, give me your horse, or I'm using your house to stay at tonight, or I need half your food to feed my soldiers. If at any point anyone refused that order, that in itself is a crime that was worthy of being executed if you were not a Roman citizen. So Pliny is not explicitly going out of his way to execute these people because they're Christians. He's going out of this way to execute these people because they're refusing a direct order from the governor. And I just wanted to make that distinction because it was one of the things that I had to wrap my head around. Now, you might think this might be the end of it. You know, Pliny uncovered some Christians, the ones who refused to recant. He executed them. But it doesn't end there. And this is why he's writing to the emperor. Because after this initial round of executions, there's a sudden surge in accusations and publicly charging of people by other citizens in the province you know, this guy over here, he's a Christian. The, the, that guy over there, he's a Christian. Oh, oh yeah, never mind that I owe him a whole pile of money. He's definitely 100% a Christian. This is the concern Pliny has, is that this initial wave of executions that he dealt with has sparked a surge in accusations, which he started investigating. And at, through his investigation, he gathers together dozens of people, more and more people. And he, again, asks those people, do you want to recant your Christianity or are you a Christian? And those people who say, oh, I'm not a Christian or, oh, yeah, yeah, I was a Christian, but yes, I recant my Christianity and he makes them prove that by offering a sacrifice to the emperor. In the words of Pliny, those who are Christian cannot, it is said, be forced to do any of these things. So those who recant, those who offer sacrifice, they're acquitted. He lets them go. But more and more of these accusations are coming forward. Pliny's torturing groups of people to find out you know what are you doing what you know it's suddenly everywhere it's like you know uh, you, you you go here you think you know people are one way and all of a sudden you find out no you're not you're not you're not you think four or five people suddenly four or five people turn to 20 20 turns into hundreds you're realizing it's not just this village over here it's the village over there it's a village over there it's this city it's that city Pliny's finding hundreds and hundreds of people. And according to Pliny, the amount of Christians is so numerous. Quoting Pliny now, There are many of all ages, every rank, and both sexes who are summoned and will be summoned to confront danger. The infection of this superstition has extended not merely through the cities, but also through the villages and country areas. Everybody's a Christian. Well, not everybody, but everybody of every 
a range you can imagine. There are nobles in the area who are Christians. There are poor people who are Christians. There are slaves who are Christians. Men, women. It's one of the, who's a Christian? Hey, you, my neighbor could be a Christian, and I wouldn't know it. This is what he's coming into, and he's finding it bewildering. And he's torturing them to find out, A, what, because he's never encountered a Christian. So he's torturing them. What is Christian? What do you do? What do you do that's so bad? Why aren't you recounting your faith? He's doing all these things. And through the course of his tortures, he finds out what it is Christians do. And he describes a ritual they do. Some of them are saying, I'm not Christian, or yeah, I was a Christian, but I gave that up, you know, three years ago. One guy said, I haven't been a Christian for 20 years, you know, uh, you know that sort of thing. So clearly Christianity was all through this province and is through this province. Some people are actively Christian. Some of them may be Christian in secret. Some of them may be, you know, surface Christians, but, you know, as soon as the guy, you know, threatens you with execution, whoa, yeah, let, let me sacrifice that pork on the altar. No problem. So this is what he's running into, but he describes one of their rites that they do, one of the very first regular Christian rites. And he says that even the people who aren't actively Christian are still doing this. And he's not sure whether or not this itself is a crime, but this is what he's found out that some of the people that are Christians are doing and some of the people that used to be Christians are still doing. Quoting Pliny now, they maintained, however, that all their guilt or error involved was that they were accustomed to assemble at dawn on a fixed day to sing a hymn to Christ as God, to bind themselves by an oath, not for the commission of some crime, but to avoid acts of theft, brigandage, and adultery, and not to break their word, and not to withhold money deposited with them when asked for it. When these rites were completed, it was their custom to depart and then to assemble again to take food, which was, however, common and harmless. They had ceased, they said, to do this following my edict, which was in accordance with your instructions. I had outlawed the existence of secret brotherhoods. So Pliny, as one of his first edicts, the first year on the job, Trajan makes it a law to ban any secret brotherhoods. This is uh, not necessarily to go out and um, you know find out and dig up and kill off the, any Christians he's finding. Trajan is worried about revolts and groups of powerful people gathering together and fomenting revolts. You know, groups of people cause problems. So Trajan makes it a law across the empire banning secret groups of people, secret meetings. So this is what Pliny is thinking that this is the this is what you're doing is you know, it's a crime to have a secret brotherhood. And these Christians, they're gathering as a ritual on a fixed day at dawn. This is Sunday morning. You know, this is the Sabbath day that's being celebrated. I think, actually, I think it might be Saturday, um, the Sabbath day. So the Christians are gathering, they're singing hymns, and then they're swearing an oath. You know, I'm not going to steal. Uh, you know, I won't, uh, I won't uh, cheat or covet another man's wife. I'll keep my word. You know, I, I won't withhold money if somebody lends. If I, pardon me, if somebody lends me money, I will pay it back. And then they do the what I think is being described as the Eucharist. That's the taking of, um, you know, the bread. You know, this eat the bread, this is my body, drink the wine, this is my blood, that type of thing. I think that's what's being described there when they assemble again to take food. Or maybe they're just assembling to have a meal together as a community. I don't know. But this is what Pliny finds out, and he's like, well, it's not really breaking the law, it is. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not doing other things. You know, they, they didn't know 
that this was against the edict. They didn't realize that this was a secret brotherhood since they all gather quite openly to do this. Pliny, through the course of his uh, digging up these Christian groups, executing the Christians that will not recant, there's a lot of bodies mounting up. One of the things that Romans did, and maybe you, you probably didn't realize this, but this is something Romans did, they would sell dead bodies to be used for whatever. So there are there is a market for dead bodies within the Roman Empire. Pliny is saying that so many Christians have been executed that the dead bodies which are normally rare to purchase because most people when a body dies you bury it or you burn it, you know, you do whatever funeral rites of it. Slaves don't necessarily get that, so, you know, you can buy the body of a slave or a criminal who's executed. So many people are being executed that the market for dead bodies becomes literally a flooded market, and bodies are being put up for sale. You know, buy this corpse here at a reduced price. Two for one today. Now, one of the things I I mentioned earlier when I was talking about those first couple of quotes from Pliny was that there was a group in that initial letter that Pliny referred to as uh, lunatics that were registered them as due to be sent back. What Pliny is talking about there is... Rome has a two-tiered justice system, actually a three-tiered justice system. There was the justice system, pardon me, the justice system, the group of laws that governed how to manage and punish slaves. There were the group of laws that governed how to manage and punish non-citizens. And then there were the group of laws that governed how to punish Roman citizens. So being a Roman citizen had some privileges attached to it in terms of how the law handled you compared to a non-citizen. So for example, um, Jesus was crucified. That is a standard punishment for that crime the crime of refusing to give offerings to Caesar. It was equivalent to being a traitor to the Roman Empire. It was the equivalent of starting revolt. All of them were equivalently punished. You got tortured, crucified, or some other horrific death attached to you. If you were a Roman citizen, you still got executed for the same crime, but your death was quick could be as simple as just being beheaded and uh, one of the first apostles that's Paul Paul is a Roman citizen and even though Paul is a vocal and pronounced Christian Paul doesn't get crucified he doesn't get uh, executed in the games by uh, you know being forced to fight uh, animals Paul is beheaded. So there's a different level of justice system for citizens, non-citizens, and slaves. Pliny is sorting out in this group of Christians, because some of these Christians are Roman citizens, and Roman citizens, part of Roman law, allows them to appeal the ruling of a provincial governor. So even though these are Christians, They're refusing to recant their Christianity. And so Pliny says, well, that's fine. You're a Christian. You refuse to account your Christianity. You refuse to give offerings to Caesar. Therefore, your punishment is death. Because these ones are Roman citizens, they have the right to appeal Pliny's ruling. And that appeal goes straight to the Roman Senate and to the emperor. 
So those people that are Roman citizens, Pliny locks them all up and ships them back to Rome and they'll get a sent pardon me, they'll get a second trial there and maybe a second chance to recant or argue their case or do whatever it is. But anyways, they'll get a second chance. Everybody else who isn't a citizen, they don't get an appeal. So Pliny has got this initial group of Christians, which he's punished by execution, or the ones that were Roman citizens, he's shipped back to Rome for their appeal. And after this first wave happens, suddenly there's more public ac accusations of, you know, John's a Christian, Joe's a Christian, Jeremy's a Christian, we're all Christians, you know, all, you know, it's coming up everywhere he looks, people are pointing fingers and saying, this person is a Christian. And so Pliny is methodically investigating all of these. He's torturing people, you know, tell me who you, who other else is a Christian. People are saying, you know, I was a Christian years ago. I'm not now. They're giving opportunities to recant their Christianity or deny it or give offerings to Caesar. And the ones that are doing this are being acquitted and some of them aren't. And the ones that don't, they get executed, which is probably crucifixion or some other similar horrendous execution, unless they were a Roman citizen which case they got a quick death, beheading, that type of thing. As he's investigating this, coming into more and more Christians, more and more of them aren't recanting. He's being forced to execute more and more of them. He's overwhelmed because Christians are suddenly showing up everywhere, in all the cities, all the provinces, at all ranks. And now this is becoming a severe problem. And one of the thoughts that's probably in Pliny's mind is, you know, you can, if everybody is a Christian, you can only kill so many of them before there's potential for revolt on your hands. So he's written a letter to the emperor because you know, he's not certain what to do. The laws, if he... There's a chance if I keep going, we're going to generate a revolt. People may just be accusing people of being Christians, just manufacturing things in order to get rid of enemies. And so the emperor writes back. And this is Trajan's response. Short and sweet. But this is the emperor's official position on Christianity. Quoting the Emperor Trajan. No general rule can be laid down which would establish a definite routine. This is Trajan talking about the laws of how to handle Christians. Christians are not to be sought out. If brought before you and found guilty, they must be punished, but in such a way that a person who denies that he is a Christian and demonstrates this by his action that is, by worshipping our gods, may obtain pardon for repentance, even if his previous record is suspect. Documents published anonymously must play no role in any accusation, for they give the words pardon me, for they give the world worst example and are foreign to our age. End quote. So Trajan is saying there's no definite law settled down about what to do with Christians. So there's no law. Every case must be handled uniquely. We're not seeking out Christians. There should be no people actively looking for them. But if somebody brings Christians before you and they're found guilty, then yeah, we've got to punish them. You know, if you don't offer sacrifice to Caesar... It's tantamount to rebellion. It's a means you're a traitor to Rome, and there's only one punishment for that. But if you do, yeah, you, tain, you get a pardon. And even if, you know, your previous record is suspect, even if, yeah, I still think you might be a Christian. But hey, if as long as you worshipped the God, you know, you gave an offering, there's nothing we can do. My hand is tied. You worship the gods. We're good. So this is... Trajan saying, even if they go ahead and continue to be Christian, I don't care. 
as long as they do this thing, we're fine. We're good. And he's also saying regarding the random accusations that are happening, you know, this anonymous list being posted saying Joe Schmo is a Christian. Documents published anonymously must play no role in any accusation because they give the worst example and they're foreign to our age. Pliny's making a statement saying, you know, if you got to accuse somebody, you got to put yourself out there, be public about it. No anonymous accusations. This is Rome and the ultimate authority in Rome, the official legal position about what to do with Christians. Be a Christian all you want. I don't care. As long as you give an offering to Caesar, we're good. The next uh, account I have for you, it's not from the Bible, but it is a Christian source. This is an account, and it's a written first-hand account of two Roman Christians who were martyred in the city of Carthage at uh, 203 Common Era. So we're 90 years on, roughly, from our last account by Pliny the Younger. We're no longer in Anatolia. We're not in the province of uh, Pontus Bithynia, you know, northern Turkey. We're now in Carthage, which is near modern-day Tunis. That was, you know, the site of the... of last famous Roman Punic Wars against the Carthaginians. You know, they destroyed the city of Carthage. Well, a few generations after that, Rome comes back and founds a colony there, which becomes a huge Roman city. Carthage becomes a, in time, a huge Christian population. There's its own bishop in in Carthage. But in 203 Common Era, again, only 90 years on from the letters of Pliny the Younger that I was just talking about, there's a significant Christian population in Carthage, North Africa, near Tunis. And we know about this because the family that these... Um, martyrs were from were a well-off family. I don't necessarily know that they were nobility, but certainly they had some money because they're able to bribe guards to let them um, move to more comfortable areas of the prison. The guards are allowing them visitors and they're given material to write on. And these prisoners that are slated for execution are able to write their thoughts and accounts down like a diary in the days coming up to their execution. And this is recorded in a short uh, book called The Passion of St. Perpetua and St. Felicity. They're two women amongst a group of Christians that have all been caught by the Roman authority in Carthage. So you can uh, purchase this as well. You can usually find it's just a a couple of bucks online and some places that's free to get because it's it's a short document. You know, it's 30-some, 40 pages with both the accounts of Felicity and Perpetua and also including a forward and an afterward. So the version I got, it was, it was four bucks for 40 pages, um, but it was fascinating for me to be, read actual first-hand accounts of somebody who lived just at the, the start of the third century, and it's their thoughts going into the few days leading up to their execution. Perpetua is 
a mother. She's 22 years old. She has two, two brothers. Her parents are still alive. And she has a baby who's just old enough that he's still suckling at her breast when she is arrested along with a group of others. Felicity being one of these other people in this group. Felicity is eight months pregnant when she's arrested. Felicity's execution is uh, stayed until she gives birth. And she gives birth prematurely from the stresses of being in the prison. But the baby supposedly survives and is handed off to somebody else. Perpetua's child is still suckling. And just in the days leading up to her execution, she finally gives the child away to somebody else. But her family is uh, wealthy enough that they're able to, like I said, bribe the soldiers that are at the prison. And they're able to give them, um, you know, some documentation to write down their thoughts with. And they visit them. They beg them to recant. But they don't. So they're slated for execution, but they write down what happens. So we have some writing, first-hand accounts from a Christian perspective about what it's like to be in a Roman trial and what it's like to be in a Roman prison and that sort of thing. We know from Perpetua's account that the trial is public. There are Uh, accused are brought forward one at a time they're given the opportunity to recant and the opportunity to make a sacrifice to the emperor this this sounds familiar this is what Pliny the younger did he gave them the opportunity to recant those who recant were uh, allowed to make an offering to the emperor as proof that they're recanting And many of the people that are arrested in this group do recant. But some of them will not. And Perpetua is one of those people who's adamant from the time she's arrested that she will not recant. And her father comes to her. He interrupts the trial and begs her. He runs out onto the floor and begs her to make the sacrifice to recant. And the Roman governor, a governor by the name of Hilarion, he, of course, won't take any disruption to the court, and he has the father beaten in front of her. But Perpetua refuses to recant. Felicity refuses to recant. There are several others who refuse to account, uh, recant. Uh, Jocundus, Saturninus, Artaxius and Quintus, all of them are slated for execution along with Felicity and Perpetua. We don't have any writings from Jocundus, Saturninus, Artaxius, or Quintus. Their families presumably weren't wealthy enough or connected enough to help them out. Quintus dies in the prison while he's waiting to be executed. Perpetua tells us that the prison is stiflingly hot. It's North Africa. They're not well fed, you know, not so not well cared for, you can imagine. But their Perpetua's parents are wealthy enough that they bribe the guards to let Perpetua and uh, Felicity move to a more comfortable area of this crappy prison so they're not so suffering and the day before their execution is slated uh, one of the practices of the romans even if you're slated for a horrendous execution you get a last meal they were given a choice of a last meal before their execution so they have a small but respectable Christian feast amongst these people who are about to be martyred. And as they're marched out on the day of the execution, they're not crucified. Instead, they're slated to 
be executed with uh, gladiators fighting animals in the arena for the entertainment of the citizens of Carthage. The men and women are forced to dress up, and they're made to fight animals. So there is a bear in the ring. The bear is tied to like an elevated bridge or platform. One of the this Christian group is also chained to the same platform as the bear, but they can't coax the bear out to attack him. So they instead send this guy against a leopard. The leopard kills him. There's a boar as well who gores one of these people. And Felicity and Perpetua are tied to a bull, which is set loose into the arena, which drags them around, stomps on them, gores them, that sort of thing. And this, of course, is to the entertainment of the Carthaginian Roman crowd. So not that I wanted to get heavy with the details on this, or go deep into the cruelty of the situation. Cruelty is often the point with Roman punishments, especially if you're not a citizen. But I was fascinated that there was this scenario that cropped up right at the period of time that we're looking at within this third century. So Perpetua dies in 202 common era and she's in north africa you know it's not too far from our main character of the podcast uh, the series of podcast episodes saint george but she's a christian and you know not 250 270 not later third century that's when saint george crops up but she's at the start of the third century 90 years later we're going to run into saint george but 90 years before perpetua was pliny the younger in his run-in with a group of christians and how he dealt with them and one of the things that i was fascinated about learning about early christianity was this calling things the passion you know, you're being executed. Why are you calling it the passion? And one of the things that I learned about why it's called a passion was at this time, you know, when we think of Christians and Christianity today and heaven and hell, we think when you die, if you're a good Christian, you go to heaven. And if you're a bad Christian, you go to hell. And if you're in between that, you're you're in you know a limbo for a while uh, until uh, a correct amount of time or penance is done, and then you get to go to heaven. That wasn't the way from day one of Christianity. In fact, at this time, Christians universally believe that even if you're the best Christian on the planet. Even if you're a saint, when you die, you don't go straight to heaven. You wait. Your soul is stuck in some limbo, and you're waiting for the anointed hour when Jesus returns and heaven and you know the heavenly kingdom starts and all that sort of thing. And that's the point when everybody who's died and been dead for thousands of years that's the point when your soul is judged and you're allowed into heaven or not except for martyrs martyrs get a shortcut martyrs don't have to wait martyrs get an immediate trip directly into heaven so in a way martyrs exceed saints in the priority or the hierarchy of who gets into heaven at this time everybody believes no matter how good you are when you die your soul is stuck in some limbo somewhere and you're waiting for the anointed hour at that point then you have a chance to go to heaven 
unless you're martyred like Jesus was or like Felicity and Perpetua and Saturninus, Jotinus, Artaxius, all these guys. If you're one of these groups, this lucky few to get martyred, then you go straight to heaven. The last account I'm going to give to you today was written um, not by a contemporary, and it's a Christian source, but it's taking exactly in the middle of the third century. It's exactly just a few years i'd say exactly it's not exactly it's a few years before our hero saint george is born but there's another lesser saint known about during the third century saint george will be born a few decades later or he might even have been born right about now but saint maurice was born in 250 Common Era. He was a Roman general. He was an Egyptian uh, military leader, but he was a Roman citizen. He came to lead the Theban Legion, so the Roman Legion that was stationed in Thebes, Egypt. This by this time, that's 80, right around 82, 80, Common Era. So we will be smack dab in the middle of the life of St. George. Right in the middle of this time, Maurice, a Roman citizen who lives in Egypt, is leading the Theban Legion, which is a Roman legion. But that legion is 100% made of Christians. Maurice, the general, the Roman citizen, is also likewise a open Christian. And this is accepted by the emperor. It's accepted by Rome. There's an entire legion that is entirely made up of Christians and it has been allowed to exist. But a problem crops up when the emperor an emperor by the name of Maximian, who I'll be talking about in my future episode on this. But Maximian is trying to handle a revolt, and he orders Maurice and the legion that he controls, the Christian legion, into an area which is now, I think, called uh, St. Bernard Pass, just across the Alps. It's in what they would call Gaul, but it's modern-day Switzerland today. The area that they're talking about at the time is called Agonum. It's now called St. Maurice in Switzerland. But they were ordered to attack and slaughter a village of rebels against Maximian. But that village was known to the legion to contain Christians. And so they refused the direct order from the emperor to attack. I've been talking about this entire episode. What happens when you refuse a direct order from a legal authority, whether it was from the governor or a general, or in this case, the emperor? If you refuse a direct order, that is itself is enough to warrant execution so the emperor maximian is dealing with an entire legion of christians that have refused a direct order and so he orders what is known as decimation and that is where a uh, one in every 10 soldiers in the legion is killed this is an incredibly severe punishment for a legion. It's the worst punishment a legion could get. It only happens under the worst defeats. After every tenth soldier has been killed, they're ordered again to do the same, and the legion itself refuses again, refuses a second order from the emperor. And so the entire legion 
all 10,000 men or 30 or 30,000, however many people's in a legion. It's thousands. All of them are executed. This took place in 287 Common Era, and this will be where we're starting our story about St. George in our next episode. Okay, there we go. This is the end of episode one in our series on the real-life history of the time and place of St. George. I hope you found it fascinating, this episode, covering actual written first-hand accounts of early Christians. So these are some of the first ever accounts outside the Bible of Christians. We have some from Roman perspectives, some from Christian perspectives, discussing how their thoughts and feelings are about Christians, about Romans, how they handle things from a legal perspective, and what they thought and felt about each other. So I hope you found this episode fascinating. I was having a lot, just incredibly interesting, all the stuff that I didn't know existed about some of these very early Christians. You know, in my mind, all I know is is the Bible. If you want to know about early Christianity, read the Bible. But finding these other things that are outside the Bible, first-hand accounts written by Romans about Christians, Christians about Romans, I found it just utterly fascinating to get these different perspectives And next month, we're going to be digging into what's known as the crisis of the third century as we build up to the birth and time and events that St. George would have lived through. Tune in next month as we look at the crisis of the third century and how it impacted the time and place of St. George. This has been an episode of the Grim Dark History Podcast. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show.